Good morning, and uh, welcome to Sunday School. We're going to get right into Revelation chapter number 9 this morning. We're going to pick up here on the sixth trumpet here in just a few moments. I, uh, I was looking at this this morning and just kind of going, I mean, I looked at it earlier this week, but looking over where we were going to be this morning, and uh, I was looking at it last night a little bit. And we're going into two separate parenthetical uh, portions right after the sixth trumpet. And so just a reminder, in case I forget to tell you, that there are really three major parenthetical moments in the book of Revelation. And uh, what is meant by that is it's like a pause on the chronology. And then God says, okay, let me tell you about something that's going to span a little bit through all of this. Uh, and of course, some of those is the witnesses. Some of those are going to be the I'm a mighty angel with a little book and uh, some things that are going on in heaven at the same time. And so uh, God does that from time to time in the book of Revelation, gives us a little bit of a pause from the chronology and says, these are some things that are taking place during this period of time. And so we'll be going over that in just a moment. But if you're there in Revelation chapter number nine, let's pray and ask God to be able to speak to us this morning. And then we'll look at this sixth uh, trumpet judgment. Father, we thank you for the great privilege it is to be able to come and to be able to learn. And Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that as we read through the book of Revelation and study it, Lord, it gives us great uh, comfort, hope. It also fills us with terror for those who will be here, uh, Lord, after we are called up to be together with you, Father. And Lord, I know that you're coming. And Lord, as we will be talking about this morning, in this morning's message, Father Lord, we know that you're coming and you're coming soon. Lord, these things that we read about are, Lord, just a short while away before they come to pass. I pray that it would encourage us, that strengthen us as well for the great work that is ahead of us. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, read with me, if you will, in chapter number nine. Of course, we just got done with the serpents. I mean, the, uh, the scorpion uh, demons, basically. In chapter number 9, 1 through 3, 12, uh, and it says, in verse number 12, it says, Oh, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Uh, now, you remember the, the Ark of the Covenant had four horns on it as well, and uh, it was a picture of what's taking place here saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horse in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jackanoth, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of man, men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto uh, serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by those, these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not uh, worship devils and idols of gold and of silver and of brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. This sixth trumpet judgment is some kind of, um, I mean, there's no really way to put it other than some kind of hellish invasion of some serpent demons, which sounds almost fantasy, doesn't it? But nevertheless, it will happen. It's the truth of what the Word of God says. There are apparently four demons of probably greater significance or rank, rather, uh, in, in that order of things that have been bound in the Euphrates River. Now, I, I have often, there was, a, I also wondered why, um, if the Garden of Eden is 
was said to be between the Euphrates and the Tigris and the, the two others that I can't remember off the top of my head. And I always just wonder, why can't we find it? And then it dawned on me that there was this big old flood thing going on, you know, at some point that destroyed everything. And uh, so I don't know if the Tigris and the Euphrates River are the same ones mentioned in Genesis or not, or if those, obviously, the waterways are moved around quite a bit and the land mass has moved around quite a bit. Who knows? But nevertheless, the Euphrates River has always been a significant river. And there are four demons that have been bound in the Euphrates River. You say, is it a deep river? I don't think it's particularly that deep of a river. You say, well, how are they bound in it? I really don't know. My point is, is that uh, God said that they're there and they're bound there. They could be well underneath the river. They could, it could be symbolism. I have no idea, but it sounds as if there are four real demons who are bound in the Euphrates River it's in some way or another. It's also important to remember that um, angels are spiritual beings. Y'all with me for a moment? And so they can be present even here and you'd never see them. So because they're bound in the Euphrates River doesn't mean that we can look for them because angels are spiritual beings and they can be present and not seen. And so they could literally be bound in the river and be um, imperceivable to the human eye. Remember when, uh, was it Elijah or Elisha? I can't even remember. It was, a, a, it was Elijah, right? Because Elisha came after. Elijah, remember he was there uh, and he came out of his house basically and was surrounded by the Syri was Syrians. I'm, 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 I'm grasping at straws here just because it comes to mind. You remember when he came out and, he, and, and then his servant said, oh, we're doomed. He said, no, 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 there's more with us than there is of them. And then he opened his eyes and he saw all the heavenly hosts basically uh, surrounding them. Listen, they were there already. It's not like they magically appeared, right? They were there already. They're just unperceivable to our human eyes because we live in a physical world. God created us for the physical. And of course, we are sensitive to the spiritual because we were born with the dead spirit, but we have a spirit, right? So we're sensitive to those things, but not, we don't perceive the things that are spiritual. And so, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get too philosophical on you this morning, but the re reality is, is these four demons are there. And whether they're there in plain, what we would consider plain sight or not bound, I have no idea. But it would appear that they're literally there. They're just not perceivable to mankind. They have been prepared to torment men for a year, a month, and one day. And so they will, uh, they, will, they will have free reign to be able to torment mankind for a little over a year. And they've been prepared to slay. Look at this in verse number 15. And the four angels which were loosed, uh, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. Our humanity will be decreased by another third by the death of these, uh, these particular angels and their judgment. One fourth of humanity has already been killed. Now, under kind of a rough global estimate of what how many people are on the world today, one fourth of humanity has already died up until this point in the tribulation period. Now, that's 1.75 billion people, roughly. If you take another third of what's remaining today, just using today's numbers, you would be talking about another 1.75 billion people in one plague. So all of the things that we've seen to this point has killed about a, a billion and three quarters of people. This one trumpet judgment will kill as many people as all the things we've seen so far up to date. It's a mind staggering amount of people. When you think about uh, three and a half billion, three and a half billion people will have died after this is over. It's, a, it's just, a, it's really, it's, that's almost not even perceivable, is it? Uh, I don't know. Anybody know what the population of China is? 1.8 billion. That's the entire population. I thought it was close. Um, that's the entire population of China missing. Gone. And I think India is pretty close, right? In 1.5 or 1.3 or something like that. At this point, it would be like destroying all the people in, who live in India and all the people who live in China all at one time, one fell swoop. And so in the course of just a few short years, this is how many people will die. These four uh, demons will be leading an army of about 2 million people. That, we find that from number 
uh, from verse number 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. Of course, 200,000, thousand, in the days of John, I mean, not very many people counted it to, to millions. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, really, the reason why we use millions is because of the, the level of science we're in, because we need that many numbers and money, really. Other than that, you wouldn't use very many millions. Uh, just it's the day and age we lived in their day and age you didn't use millions very if you look at ancient writings very much very few of them uh, use that kind of numbers and so that's why it's recorded to us this way but you're talking about 200 million people or de de either demons or people or whatever it may be will be at their disposal and you say why do you say it like that apparently they are going to now you, you look at the description look at me if you will and thus I saw uh, the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jaconeth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. When you look at what he's saying here, and uh, uh, I was looking for a different portion. Oh, here we go, 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for in their tails were like unto serpents, and their heads... Uh, and with them they do hurt. There is sometimes when you look at these descriptions, we're not sure if uh, John seeing really a, you know a horse with a lion's head on it or something that that's the best way he can describe it using the words that uh, you and I speak. So using human language and un his understanding of what's going on is that the best that he could describe it as. I mean, if he was shown a vision, for instance, if you were shown a vision and you had, take yourself back in time by 2,000 years, erase all of your modern knowledge, okay? And if you were shown a vision of someone holding a phone in their hand, what would, how would you have described it? You know, watching some, I don't know, news broadcast or some YouTuber somewhere on the other side of the world going live, watching something, what would you have how would you have described that in English? Or, or in his case, Hebrew or uh, Greek? How would you, you see where I'm going with that? It would almost sound, it would sound fantasy and miraculous, wouldn't it? And so understand that I'm not saying that they're not literal, but on the other hand, we're not been told they're literal, and there are many indications where it says like unto a serpent, that it may or may not be there. Now, there are three theories concerning the identity of these horsemen. They're an army of literal demons, which kill one-third of humanity, as described here in Revelation. That's certainly a very real possibility, and I don't, I don't disagree with that. Uh, they could be a symbolism of a description of a massive, massive invasion um, from uh, China in the east because they're coming from the Euphrates. And that's kind of the dividing line of east and west. Many times people use that as the dividing line. Now, that's been a theory that's been kicked around for uh, uh, just a long time, really. There's a lot of, uh, of biblical writing or people commentary on that and saying, oh, it's going to be China. And this view sees the dramatic descriptions of the horseman and all those kind of things as the best John could do to describe modern day weaponry. And so um, that's the best he could do in his first century knowledge. That's what they're saying, at least. Now, China currently boasts of an army of about this size anyway. And they're the only nation in world history that has ever been at that level either. You say, is, is it China? I don't know. I, I don't know. The amount of people who have died in the world up until this point makes me hesitate to think that, um, that it could be, but I don't know. I, I really don't know. A combination of these two views is another view that people have uh, talked about and uh, I've read about, and I've, I've actually seen a lot of people combine these two views where uh, basically the, the demons will possess a human army, and then advance. Uh, I mean, I, I really don't know. I just believe what the Bible says. I am just sure that there's going to be an, an army of demons that will come. Whether they have tails of snakes or not, I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. It's all terrifying. And you're going to, it, there's going to be, uh, you're going to watch and, and see the world fall into some of the most uh, horrible despair that it has ever seen since the days of Noah. The amount of people that are dying here has not, this is not, we have not seen anything like this 
we'd have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter number what, eight, nine, to be able to see anything. 6,000 years of human history, and we've never seen anything like this. And so what you find here is even after three and a half billion people, almost half the world's population is, is killed. Revelation chapter number nine and verse number 20, it says, and the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and, of, and idols of gold and, uh, and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor work, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their for sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. There is no repenting. What I, what I think, and I am careful to say this is my opinion, okay? What I think of is going on today is we see the spirit of Antichrist today. I'm not saying that the Antichrist is around. Uh, I'm not saying that we know who he is. Matter of fact, I am of the opinion that we probably, you and I will probably never know who the Antichrist will be. And that there will be a great, you, you may even like the Antichrist at, from, a, from a personal level, you know, moments or days, weeks, months before, the, before his rise after the rapture. You say, how could you possibly say something like that? Well, because he's probably going to be a pretty likable guy. And he's going to reunite the world. You know, I mean, that, that, by peace. Uh, I, I can't imagine him not having a certain charm to him. You with me? Can't, just can't imagine that. The reality is, um, I don't remember where I was going. I lost my train of thought. You'll forgive me. Where was I going? Oh, uh, the reality is that we are going to find in the, the book of Revelation some things that take place that we've never seen before. I really did lose my train of thought bad. I didn't have enough coffee this morning. Spirit of Antichrist. Thank you, Brother John. Listen, the spirit of Antichrist is present today. And what I think is taking place in our world today is when the God says that he's going to bring strong delusion, I believe that that is being already brought on the minds of the, the citizens of this world. You say, what do you mean by that? I get so weary of hearing about global warming and about you know, man-made destruction and, and all of these ideas about how the, um, we, you and I are being fed information from Satan. There's no doubt about it. You realize that, right? Listen, you take your phone out of your pocket, and I guarantee you the mass, vast majority of the information you get is demonic in nature, or at least it has demonic fingers into it. You say, that sounds conspiracy. That sounds psycho. That really does, doesn't it? That's not stuff you hear in church, you know? You say, what do you mean by that? I mean that when when the world goes crazy over a virus that has a 98% success uh, survival rate, you, you follow me for a moment? I'm not saying that there's no virus. You, you understand? But if the world can go crazy and so much altering ideas, and you and I have no idea. I mean, I, I think you, you would be, I, I don't care who's listening to this. You and I have no idea what is actually taking place. If, if you think you actually know what's taking place in the world, then I'm sorry that you probably are a little naive. We have no idea what's going on. We get so, listen, you listen to one doctor, he says, he says, ah, it's the cold. You listen to another doctor and he says the sky's falling. How can all of these professionals be so different how can we, how can we, we hear, we hear some people tell us that we're all going to burn up and die in about 15 years because the world's going to get, you know, too hot and we're all going to die. And then other people say, well, it's been here forever, you know, it's not going anywhere. How can there be such difference in information, what is considered to be fact, every one of them is purporting what they're talking about as fact, you with me? And we're consuming information. I'm not against information. I'm not against being informed. I'm not against all those things. But if, you, if, you, if, if, an, if a Christian can sit down and really be ignorant about the fact that the, um, Jesus himself, God has already told us that the devil is the prince and power of the air. And that he has a great amount of influence in our world system. Okay? That's the... That's the governments and the education and the, the news medias and all those kind of things. The devil has a massive influence in that. And so we must be very, very careful 
because the spirit of Antichrist is already present. Matter of fact, we've been reading and going over the book of Jude for weeks now. And what do we see? The spirit of Antichrist, don't we? Well, Jude is writing that when? 2,000 years ago. And so the spirit of Antichrist is here and it's been present. And I, and I want us to understand that I am not standing up here telling you that, uh, that we shouldn't be mindful of things and, and that we shouldn't be informed. I'm not saying that at all. I like to be informed. I love to read. And I think that having, having, uh, having being well read and, and being well versed in the things that are going on in the world is a, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I think it's important to get as much information as you can. And to, to, to take that information, use this as a filter, use this as a filter for that information, and try to apply it the best you can. I'm not against that. But what I point, I think, more than anything is, is that when people aren't going to repent, and half the world has died, I think that what's taking place today is we are, we are seeing an effort to manipulate the thinking of people at a scope that we've never seen before. You say, that sounds conspiracy theory. No, it sounds biblical. Satan has always tried to manipulate the thinking of mankind. You could all go back to Genesis chapter 1 with me, or 2, 2, and you know what you'd find? Satan manipulating the thinking of people. He's trying to, he uses reason when he can't use trickery. He, he'll try to use some false logic on us, and, and he uses, uh, he, he uses half-truths and, and even God's word sometimes to deceive God's people, but not just God's people, but to keep lost people lost and to be able to use them as pawns in his schemes. And so when you find that the world is slowly being fed lies, right? You, you've all been here for forever because we've, you know, something at some point blew up and now uh, we crawled out of some primordial swamp some, somewhere at some point in history that nobody can really tell us when exactly it was. And then we've turned into what we are today and then our sun's burning out and that you and I need to stop driving our cars. You with me? Uh, because we're all going to kill each other. We're driving our cars. The world's going to uh, just burn up and we're all the ice caps are going to melt and we're all going to be sitting on top of our roofs um, in some kind of I don't know rising flood water catastrophe now think if we've been fed those kind of that kind of information it sounds silly saying it like that but that's really being taught right you remember when um, Al Gore came out with that inconvenient truth I mean it sounded dumb when I, when, we, when I was a teenager, or early teenager, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. But it's becoming mainstream idea, is it not? How many people do you know that buy into the, to the global warming and climate change business? You all know people like this. You see, I'm, I'm using that as an example for a moment. You ready? Because we are being trained as a, as a, as a society. We're being trained that there is a perfectly rational reason for all of these judgments that will take place. And so I used to read this and I used to go, this is insane. The, the, the things that are seen in these seven years, that no one will repent, that people will harden their heart. How can anyone continue in a life of sin and not repent and beg God for mercy? in this world well because they're they're being deceived and they went into this tribulation period with a very strong deception to begin with and we can see that this is continuing and if christ doesn't come back soon listen we're in a world of hurt already much less the tribulation period you'll find it in chapter number 10 we switch over to a parenthetical uh, section. Uh, I'm sorry for all that commentary, but I, I, I thought to myself, how in the world? Could, I was thinking that last night and this morning and throughout the night, really. I thought to myself, I don't understand how people could not repent. Can you all see it now, though? Can, can you see that? Does that has ever one, you ever wondered how in the world can you see what we see in the book of Revelation and people not just fall flat on their face and beg God for mercy? But you can see it, can't you? 
Can you not see the delusion that is being spread already today? And so in chapter number 10, you'll find the mighty angel with the little book, of course. Uh, let's, re let's read it because we'll go over it pretty quickly. I don't have very many uh, notes on this particular subject. And I saw uh, another mighty angel come down from heaven, a clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was at, uh, as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders utter, uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to ride, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel said, I saw stand upon the sea, I'm sorry, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that, the, uh, that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that uh, which are therein that they should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hands of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What we find here is the mighty angel with the little book, and this is the second major uh, topical parenthetical point in Revelation. It describes a heavenly announcement uh, and then, of course, then chapter number 11, we'll find two witnesses. That'll be the next one. An amazing uh, angel, really. He's clothed in, is in, in clouds and his uh, rainbow on his head, basically. Face shining like the sun. His feet are pillars of fire. He's standing with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. And he speaks uh, like the roar of a lion. When he speaks seven thunders, and John's not allowed to write these things down. I don't know why. I don't know what the what they are and quite frankly whenever i'm you and me are exactly alike whenever we are told uh that something happened and then we're not told what it is what's the first thing we want to know yeah what do you say well that if you do that you know what you do you put the focus on the wrong place if god wanted you to know what the thunderings were they would have been written in the book and so the focus is not the thunderings of what is being said the focus is what else is taking place and so when we look at this, we find who is this, who is this angel? Of course, we only know three angels by name, right? Anybody want to take a guess? Lucifer, Lucifer Gabriel. Gabriel, and Michael. And so we only know three angels by name. So who's this angel? It sounds like a pretty important figure in history, or uh, in biblical history, or at least future history. I know that sounds weird, but to God it is, right? It's all history. And so what we find here is many people believe that this is Jesus Christ. Anybody can, can give me a pro or a con for that? I can think of several in, in both directions. His face like a sun. Okay, so many people think that this particular angel is Jesus Christ because, um, you know, because of his description. Some of his face is like the sun. And so I, I've, written, I've, I've read plenty of commentaries. Well, this is Jesus. Can, can you give me a pro or con for that? So his face is like the sun. So that's a pro for it being Christ, right? Okay. Can you think of a reason? Any other reasons? One way or the other? Why would somebody think that? Maybe why would somebody think it's not Jesus? That has been mentioned before, yes. Appeared, yeah. 
So that's a pro, another pro, right? Anybody got anything else? Did you have something, Brother Charles? A con? What's your con? I, I uh, probably agree with that. That's actually really good. I didn't think of that one. Another mighty angel, yeah. Or the captain of the Lord's hosts, yeah. Um, and so the angel of the Lord, because angel means messenger, right? So uh, the, either the angel of the Lord or it is the captain of the Lord's hosts. An, another good indication is who does this angel swear by? The creator. Would Jesus swear by himself? I mean, he's swearing by another other than himself, and that, would, that makes no sense. There are, um, there are a couple of things. Listen, I, I, I would say that it is not because that would mean that Jesus is now appearing before his second appearing. Again, right? The next time Christ comes back truly and stands, where's his foot? On earth. The next time God stands on earth, uh, there's not going to be any gray area whether it's Jesus or not. He's coming, the next time he comes, we're promised he's coming back with what? Ten thousands of his saints to, to finish everything and rule and set up his kingdom. And so we know it can't be Christ. I get how people see that it is him and that they, they, they see some of these things, but it can't be him. It doesn't fit with the rest of the scripture. And so while there are some indications and some things that are some similarities, it does not fit with the totality, uh, the, uh, the totali uh, I keep wanting to say totalitarian, but that's not the word I'm looking for. The total, the total um, yes, thank you, Miss Patty. I'm having the worst time with my brain today. I need to get it in gear. The totality of scripture. And so what we find here is that there's going to be no more delay. That's his message. There is no more delay before the final judgment of, begins to fall. And you say, well, has there been delay? Because we've been reading it back to back to back to back, we don't know if there's gaps between these judgments of significant note. And so apparently there has been gaps between judgments because that's what the indication would seem, right? If God says there's no more delay, judgment, the, the, the last of the judgments are going to come and there will be no more delay. At this point, we see that. You say, when did that announcement take place? I really don't know. But at some point... Uh, because this is a parenthetical thing. It doesn't fall along with the, the flow of things. John's told to eat the book, which is sweet to the taste and bitter to the belly. Anybody have an idea what that symbolizes? It's uh, sweet to the taste and bitter to the belly. Well, what does the book represent? What, what's it contain? The, it, it, can, the word of God, right? It's, this is God's word, and so the angel is proclaiming God's word, and so it, it is a representation of God's word. If it's sweet to the taste and bitter to the belly, is God's word sweet to the taste and bitter to the belly? Many times it is to, those, to you and I. It's wonderful, it's great, but when we really process it in our lives, sometimes it becomes, causes us a little bit of... Bitter, bitterness, not bitterness in the sense that we get bitter. You, you see where I'm going with this in the food sense bitterness? You say, well, how do you say that? Well, because when I read God's word, it's a wonderful thing, and I love God's word, and I'm not saying anything negative about it, but when it cuts, it hurts, doesn't it? Uh, when it trims away things that I don't want trimmed away, that hurts. When it deals with what I need to deal with, that hurts, and, and so... There's a sweet, bittersweet sometimes with the Word of God. It hurts, but it's good for me. You with me? It's kind of like when Erin eats broccoli. It's good for her, but she's probably going to throw up. You know? She hates broccoli. By the way, she legitimately, if she ever tells you she can't drink, eat broccoli, she's being serious. She will literally throw up. I've never seen a child do this before in my life. She's like a champ. She's suffered through it. Yeah, good times. I was like, man, I should have got away with that as a kid. <clears throat> we don't feed her broccoli. <laughs> but you know how there are things that are good for you, but sometimes you don't really enjoy it when it's 
settling in the stomach. And that's what God's trying to point out to us. So that's the symbolism. And so we move to chapter number 11. And then uh, I got to turn the page. How are we doing on time? Oh, not bad. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. And then that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing for the, uh, uh, the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These, men, these have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power of wa over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the city, great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and uh, and they of the people and the kindreds and the tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Well we find here the two witnesses and of course once again we go into a parenthetical moment where we break the flow of chronology of revelation to be able to talk about something in greater detail. These, uh, these angel or these witnesses, I'm sorry, that are given to us here, um, they, J John's commanded, of course, to measure the temple in the first, uh, the first verse here of chapter number 11. This command is given after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD because this was written in 90 AD. You remember that? And so the temple, there's not even one stone sitting on it in another when John is told to measure the temple. Uh, so in this context, it's talking about the tribulation temple. You with me? There's no temple on earth to measure at the, at the, the writing of, of the revelation. And so he has to be speaking about the revelation or end times temple. And so it will be rebuilt. Uh, we find that from here in chapter number one, uh, 11, 1 and 2. We find it in Daniel as well that it'll be rebuilt. Uh, go with me to Daniel. Now, many people thought the rebuilding of the temple under Herod was what this prophecy of Daniel is. Daniel, uh, chapter number 9. But we know that it has, to be, uh, it has to be rebuilt again because it's been destroyed. Because there has to be a standing temple in the tribulation period. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Verse 27. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, she shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. He's talking about the temple here. He's talking about that the Messiah would come. And then after the, this is Daniel's 70th week prophecy. And then he said that there would be, um, he would confirm the covenant uh, with many for one week. That's seven years. And then at some point in the midst or the midpoint, he would uh, stop sacrifices and then he would uh, defile the temple, the Antichrist. You could also go to Matthew chapter number 24 with me, uh, but we are going to be there in this morning's message, I believe. So uh, we'll probably skip that one for now. And you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 4, and you can see, you can see that there is going to be a standing temple in the Revelation period of time. It is important, I think, to note uh, that there is not a necessity 
for the tribulation temple to be built before the rapture. That is nowhere in scripture. Matter of fact, you can pretty much build a structure pretty, you can build a pretty structure pretty quick these days. I mean, if you really want to put your, your, uh, if you really put all of the effort into making it done quickly, I mean, they put houses up in just a, just a month or two, really. If they didn't have to wait for concrete to sit up or, or people to have days off, listen, they could put up a house in no time. Because I would drive to church um, when we lived off of, over there off of Thailand, and, and I would watch as these, these new homes on Gaum were being built. And, you know, there's nobody working on them on Sunday morning, and there's nobody working on them on Sunday afternoon. But nevertheless, those things were going up fast. You say, how fast could a temple go up? Certainly, it could go up in a short few months. There's a lot of things that would need to be worked out for the temple to be rebuilt. But I think that if we are really honest with ourselves, I, I would not be surprised if they began construction on it next week. I mean, it could go that fast. There's a lot of roadblocks, don't get me wrong. A lot of roadblocks. Well, most of those roadblocks, if, if, if those were not there, they could be built quickly. You see, but I, what about the Dome of the Rock and all this kind of stuff? Well, I can tell you this, that I have watched um, several documentaries over the course of this last year on the Temple Mount. And uh, matter of fact, I just watched a documentary on the Temple Mount uh, several months ago, and it was talking about how that there are priests now that are beginning to start preparing for the sacrifices. They're working on uh, the man they were manufacturing the garb and uh, even the stuff of the high priest, and they're getting prepared for the day of sacrifice in the temple. But there is no temple, but they're pre they're preparing for it. And this was several years ago that they were preparing for it. There's no doubt in my mind that they're not prepared. They could start sacrifices next week, probably. I, mean, I don't know that to be 100% true, but they were preparing this years ago. They should be able to take care of it in the next coming days, if not weeks, if, if the temple was built. Nevertheless, I also was watching something the other day, uh, and re reading, I'm sorry, about the Temple Mount. And I was reading several Jewish historians and scholars and archaeologists say, well, you know what, we're not 100% sure that where we thought the temple site was, is where it actually is. And so they were saying, well, we think that the, they used to say that the whole, I, all my life I've heard that the Holy of Holies is sitting right inside the Dome of the Rock. Y'all heard that? And so there's really no way to build the temple, even, even an altar temple, without the Holy of Holies being exactly in the Dome of the Rock. And I, I read several noted archaeologists, historians, and Jewish scholars say, we think that the, the Holy of Holies site is actually over here, and there's nothing there. You, you with me for a moment? If they decide one day that the temple is not where it is, or, or they've been wrong for, I mean, it's not like there hasn't been wars and buildings being built and, and poured down. I mean, there's a good possibility they could be wrong. There it could have been wrong. I mean, I, I don't, that's beyond, that's within the scope of reason, isn't it not? I mean, I haven't been to the Middle East personally, but from all the people that I've been told that have been to the Middle East, they say that like there's no way to know where something was a thousand years ago unless there's a ruin, ruins, you know, because this stuff just gets torn down, built up and torn down and blown up and torn down and war. I mean, they've had wars for thousands of years there. It's going on and on and on and on. Destruction, destruction, destruction. Jerusalem is a center of a lot of it. And so whether or not the Temple Mount is in uh, the Dome of the Rock is in the way or not, I don't really know. But I can tell you this, that it wouldn't surprise me if we woke up tomorrow morning and he said, we're going to start construction on the temple over here. Because this is where it was. And so there's no, there's no qualification for a, a pre-tribulation uh, temple to be constructed, but we do know that it will be constructed. And so he measures it out. Uh, of course, the Antichrist will break his treaty with the people. He'll reinstitute the altar uh, and the sacrifices. And there will be... Uh, the court of the Gentiles is not included in the future temple. And some believe that... Uh, you'll find that here because he said don't measure that part. Uh, some believe that that's because the Jews will accept a different location uh, for the temple mount on the site of the original temple mount, of course. Uh, other than a traditional site, which is under the Muslim Dome of the Rock. And if that's the case, they could build it. They just wouldn't be able to build it as big. So the court of the Gentiles 
And, that, and that's kind of why I was, that's the segue. I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. But um, if, the, if they say the Holy of Holies is here and not in, under the Dome of Rock, then they could build the temple on a smaller scale and not include the, the big court of the Gentiles. That would definitely be in the Dome of the Rock. I, I looked at a couple of um, uh, to, you know, topographical and city overlays of where they think that these things are. And, and when you look at the, the Herod's temple with the court of the Gentiles and all that, that would never fit without destroying the Dome of the Rock. But if they built the, like, um, the original temple footprint, they could do that in the current site that I was looking at. And so that makes perfect sense to me. A divided city of Jerusalem is found here, and it will be trotted under for three and a half years, uh, 42 months. And this is the second half of the tribulation, the, the, the trotted under the second half of the tribulation. Uh, and he begins his persecution on the nation of Israel. Luke chapter 21, verse 24, Daniel 9, 27, we just read that. Um, Matthew 24 deals with it a little bit. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 deals with that a little bit. The prophecy of a divided Jerusalem is, is, is amazing in light of the fact that Jerusalem has divided, been divided in two sections already since 1967. Um, and so that means that the final status of the city and all of its holy sites, especially the Temple Mount, will be divided in the most difficult uh, ways at some point or another. There will be a, an actual resolution to this because to be divided, that means there must be what? At some point, there must be some unity, and there must be some peace, and there must be some agreements made about these holy sites are okay, and we're going to build this temple, and everybody's going to be happy about it, and there'll be peace, at least for three and a half years. The two witnesses show up. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to be quiet, I guess. We'll look at the two witnesses in a moment. I'd like you to do me a favor. Now, this week, take, uh, take some commentaries and read what you think about the two witnesses. There are a lot of theories. Elijah and Moses, uh, Enoch and, what's that? John the Baptist, Enoch and uh, Moses, uh, not Moses, yeah. Wait, Enoch and um, uh, Elijah, because they didn't, they didn't die. Uh, there's a lot of theories out there, and I'll go over uh, the different thoughts and what the, I think, what I think personally it is, um, and really at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. There's two witnesses. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think it's interesting to go over it and the pros and cons and the ideas. And, and when you do that, the reason why I go through the ideas, by the way, and the differences, like when we talked about Jesus uh, or the mighty angel or who that is, I think, it's, I think I could tell you pretty obviously what it is. But it also helps us to make sure that when we read a scripture passage that we go, here's Revelation, here's Genesis. How does this fit? Right? So now I have to, I can't just do this. And, and that's where we get in, in a lot of danger. So I'm going to, we'll stop here because if I get into the witnesses, we'll be there for a minute, for sure. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Anybody got any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, questions, anything? I try not to belabor this too much, but I also want to make sure that it's, uh, it's good for us. You know, it's not just information. So, all right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the great privileges to be able to serve you, Lord. And we look at the days that are coming. Lord, they're really frightening. Not in a sense, Father, Lord, that I'm not frightened about it, Father. And I don't think anybody else is frightening, uh, frightened about it. Or at least I hope not, Father. I hope that you've not. Lord, I know that you haven't given us the spirit of fear, but of sound mind, Father. And so, Lord, we're not, I'm not frightened for me. I'm not frightened for the people in this room. I'm frightened for those who, Lord, have accept, who have heard the gospel message, Lord, and that just refuse. They refuse to obey. They refuse to hear about their sin, their pride. And their sin keeps them from causing them to come to Christ. Lord, I am fearful, Lord, that I'll stand before you, Lord. And could have done so much more to prevent so much that will take place in the lives of many. Lord, help us not to be watchmen on the wall that don't warn but, Lord, that we would be sounding in every corner of our lives that there is judgment for sin. And it is coming swiftly. I pray you'd help us as we go in transition here into the morning service that you would speak to us in a mighty way. I pray you would be with all the things that go on and take place. And, Lord, the different ministries that are run. And, Lord, I pray that you'd be with the hearts and minds of your people this morning in such a way 
that we'll be able to see you work and move mightily amongst us. Thank you for your great care and watch care. Thank you for your great mercy and grace. Lord, we don't deserve anything. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be able to be mindful of who we are in relation to who you are. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.